<laughs> oh, you're muted, David. <laughs> Welcome to Hot Pot Talks. <laughs> <laughs> I think after four times I'd get it right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Hot Pot Talks. Um, my name is David Ng, and this is my dear friend, Jen Sunshine. Um, we are coming to you live from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, you might know us as the co-founders of Love Intersections, um, which is a media arts collective of queer, um, queer intersex and trans uh, BIPOC folks uh, who make uh, intergenerational and intersectional documentaries of folks in our community. Um, for those of uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, part of our philosophy at Love Intersections is using art to dialogue with our community about identity, culture, and uh, dialogue about our visions for social change. And so Jen and I came up with this idea to invite people in our community and folks that we really admire um, um, that are doing cultural work to talk to us, basically. You know how it goes by now. This is a weekly series live streaming to YouTube and Facebook every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, except for today. We started at 5.30, where we have free-flowing conversations with artists, activists, chefs, performers, poets, and community organizers about what it means to be an artist facing today's realities, what ethical responsibilities do we have as artists, what organizing and art making looks like during quarantine, all the while sharing our favorite hot pot ingredients. Yeah, so why why hot pot talks? What was the idea? What was the idea behind hot pot talks? Um, this idea came uh, was really came from this idea of wanting to connect with community um, around hot pot, um, the themes of warmth and nourishment, thinking about Chinatowns as nourishment, the ceremony of hot pot, sharing food, the communal nature of of hot pot, the different types of hot pot, the many different versions all over Asia, even things like fondue are forms of hot pot. Um, thinking about comfort food and also with hot pot, the different um, varieties and different textures of food and thinking about textures as a metaphor for community dialogue. And so thinking about these themes of, of nourishment and love, um, last week we really we announced, but we're really excited to uh, announce our limited edition tote bags that are available for purchase. Um, and I'm going to read to you the description that Jen put together because I think it's so beautiful. Um, have you eaten today simply means I love you in BIPOC language. A simple question asked by so many of our parents, elders and aunties everywhere evokes a shared familial understanding of love and tenderness. Uh, these feelings of unspoken care inspired hop hop talks where culture and community nourish our bodies and our hearts too. Um, yeah, maybe Jen, do you want to just take a minute to tell us about this phrase, have you eaten today and how you came up with this, this phrase? Listen, I didn't, I didn't invent this no. question. I didn't invent this phrase, have you eaten today? Um, I would say that it is a common question that, um, you know, I can, I can venture to say a lot of our parents have asked, a lot of our aunties and uncles have asked, but my personal experience is that, um, when I was growing up and, you know, I'm cooped up in my room all by myself and I'm studying, my, my dad will always bring up a, um, a plate of fruit. Um, and that was kind of the way that he demonstrated how, he, how much he loves me, was just always having that plate of chopped fruit, just so like perfectly chopped. And it's just that little simple act that tells me that he loves me. Um, and I think that is a common experience that a lot of um, BIPOCs have uh, with, their, with their parents. Um, you know, if not the plate of fruit magically appearing on the side of your desk, you'll be walking into, um, into your house and, you know, your mom might ask, have you eaten today? And I just think that that is such a beautiful, beautiful love language. Yeah, and I love how like it's also like the first thing that when you call your parents too, mm -hmm. or my parents anyways, and my aunt, it's like, have you eaten yet? Um, which is you know, evokes the same sort of feelings. Um, yeah. Well, I'm hungry, so I'm ready to <laughs> share food and eat. Um, before we invite our world-renowned uh, dear friend, Kai Chen Tom, I know everyone is so excited to see her. Um, we wanna just give a few acknowledgements of our um, practical student, practicum students who are working tirelessly and endlessly in the back end of this video stream. Um, so I wanna acknowledge uh, Cameron, Lamia, 
Jessica, Ava, and Victoria. Yeah, thanks, guys. So without further ado, we want to welcome my dear cousin, Kai Cheng Tom, to the, to the table, to the hot-pot table. <laughs> Hi, Kai. Hi. <laughs> you appeared just a little bit, a little earlier uh, with me and David just now. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm just not with it today. My headphones are not working again. <laughs> we had all sorts of technical difficulties coming into this. Um, even though Mercury Retrograde has ended, I don't know what's wrong, but... I'll just blame the pandemic for everything. So let's just blame the panini. Kai, how are you? Welcome. Hi, thank you. Oh my gosh. The two of you are already <laughs> stirring up so many beautiful feelings. I'm like, have you eaten yet? I would ask that, except David, I can see that you've got this like beautiful spread in front of you. And I'm so jealous. Like if we could only freaking travel, then maybe I would actually be eating some of that with you. David's an amazing cook, by the way, for our audience. Um, I have eaten hot pot at his place before, and it's like, oh, so amazing. So anyway, I'm feeling jealous and angry, but also a lot of love. And that feels very appropriate for like my experience with my own Chinese family. And like um, that, like how, how even in the worst of like difficult feelings, um, my parents, like even when we exploded at each other, which we did frequently, they would still bring me food <laughs> or like they would put oh. the food out. So much of uh, what, how I understand my parents and Chinese and many other BIPOC folks as families is that love is a verb and not so much words, right? Like the love language of our cultures is so much about the doing and providing. Um, like sometimes when I was in those terrible fights with my parents, I think about how they were like, but how could you question that we love you because we're doing all these things. Which yeah. is but also a deep truth. So anyway, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good segue um, to jump straight in, um, Kai, because I was get we 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 started off we start off asking sort of how our panelists all know each other or how how we all met. Um, I thought maybe we could revisit because um, Kai Cheng, we're we're, we're first cousins. Um, our mothers yeah, are cousins. Um, but we really only met in our adult lives in, what, what was it, 2012? It must have been something, yeah, 2012, I think. Yeah, um, in 2012 when our grandmother passed. Um, and we hadn't seen each other, um, I think we used to do swimming lessons together. Um, but that was the first yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was gonna ask, yeah, what was that like? meeting for the first time. <laughs> what was it like for you? <laughs> well, I won't like, so, okay. So obviously, you know, family dynamics, we hadn't, we hadn't, I, it was really the first time I had met you. There was a lot of, I think there was a lot of nerves, right? There was like meeting, meeting, meeting anyone for the first time, but then it's also like your, your cousin. And then it's also the layers of like, you know, at, you know, it was our grandmother's funeral. And I just, but I just remember we were sitting at the back, well, we were sitting in the back of a, a hearse or a, the the limo going to the cemetery. Yeah, really. oh my God, yes. Yeah, and I remember sitting in, in, in the back with you and I remember just like, you know, making small talk. And I forget what the conversation was, but I just knew that I was like, okay, so how long are you in town for? We need to... <laughs> We, we connected somehow. I think there was a queerness aspect, but there was also like a, 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 a social justice aspect, if we want to call it, that there was an artist aspect. And I was like, okay, you're only in town for like two days, but let's grab a drink. Um, yeah, that's what I remember. How about you? Oh, very similar. I mean, and the emotions, <laughs> it was a very emotional uh, week for me. And I think probably for most of us, because. Papa had had passed away and you know not to go too deep into our family dynamics but you know there was a lot of stuff our family was going through a lot of stuff at the time um and you know we hadn't we hadn't seen each other in in so many years if in fact like i don't know even <laughs> like it, it the the childhood time that i met you was really lost in the mist of my memory so as you say it was the first really the first real time and 
the hearse I remember in a, in a blurry way, but my first clear memory of you, David, is at Gum Tingle at a Golden Golden Swan restaurant in Vancouver, which is like such a staple um, for my family and a lot of the like East Vancouver Chinese folks um, mm -hmm. of that generation. Um, where we were at, we went to Papa's uh, funeral banquet, and I remember. <laughs> Like you uh, were dressed in something fabulous. I don't even know what you were wearing, but I was like, oh, I think this cousin's a gay. I've never had a queer cousin before. What? And then I remember being like, oh, I don't want to make assumptions. Like maybe he's just like in the Hong Kong style, you know, like kind of. Um, and I was like, so uh, what are you up to? What do you do? And this I remember super clearly. You were like, mm, I'm finishing my master's degrees in women's studies. And I was like, yeah, okay. So he's a gay. <laughs> so I have found my person. And we did have that drink. I remember it was so, and I was like, you know, it, it all unfolded. We like, we connected on the queerness level, but as you say, the political level too, which for me, I was like, whoa, not only is my cousin um, like, first of all, like queer um, and also like freaking stylish, like, you know, just like fallen. And then he's also, like really aligned with me politically. Um, and that blew my mind. And I don't think I've told you this, David, but I um, like had a, like a small freak out like, afterward, just by myself at home after we did hang out for the first time. Cause I was like, oh my God, like what if I'd had uh, this person, my queer cousin in my life as a teenager, maybe things would have been really, really different or maybe not. but. I would have known I wasn't like the only one in my family. Um, so it was very emotional. Yeah. And you know, and we, we've had this conversation too, and it's it's also like, it's so nice to share also like our our struggles in, in doing social justice work. Um, you know, it's also nice to be able to like share some of those 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 things as well. I wanted to ask you also, um, did, did you tell me, I think, you said that the last time before that was likely when we used to go swimming together at yes. Killarney. And did, I, did I push you into a pool? <laughs> push me into a pool. I wasn't going to say that for the audience, but uh, that is like a family legend. Um, you met me and you pushed me into a swimming pool. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. How old were you both at the time? 15. No. <laughs> we were like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, like, tiny. Like, I was six maybe you were eight or nine i don't know how old wow. like, yeah i think yeah because i stopped swimming when i was like 11 or 12 so it must must have been around then but i just i just have to mention that story because jen i think you were a little confused we were checking in earlier today and i think you felt like so you met kai and, and then, then you pushed her in a pool i <laughs> okay okay like at my grandma's uh, funeral yeah okay i was <laughs> very confused <laughs> there were other extremely dramatic things that happened at that event, but David pushing me into a pool was not one of them. <laughs> so a, a chunk of years had like gone by where you hadn't really talked to each other as you know since you were kids. Right? Yeah, it was like yeah. twelve to fifteen years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was, you know, one of the questions I I'm so curious about was that first initial moment of like queer recognition um, where it's just like, oh my God, you've like found your people. Not only are you, you know, related by blood, but also there is this like queer kinship, as you say, um, connecting you two. That's so cool and beautiful. It was really magic. It remains one of the most magical things about my family life, David, you should know that. Like, I, you're so special to me. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, um we okay. should we do possibly <laughs> well, okay, there's so much to talk about. Um, I have a million questions about the two of you. Um, but why don't we focus on Kai just a little bit yeah. since you're our esteemed guest? Um, tell us a little bit about what you do now. Um, every time I see you, uh, you're doing something new or you've changed careers or you shifted and I can't keep up. Tell us, tell us where you're at right now. Tell us what you do. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, you're so right. I'm like that 
I'm perpetually that kid who can't choose her major. <laughs> <laughs> and I finished uh, school, but I still can't choose. Um, but like, so it makes all, it all makes sense in my head, the things I do. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a writer and uh, like community worker. And that's sort of, that's been true my whole working life. Uh, like I started working in community as like a 16, 15 year old at um, Q Community in Vancouver, which was at the time, of course, the center. And I was part of their um, Pride Speak program, like uh, yeah. which, you know, doing workshops around homophobia. And that um, from that, you know, I just went into um, a social work degree and I did clinical social work for a few years. And then I um, stopped being a social worker to focus on conflict resolution and mediation. So profession, my professional title is that I am a conflict resolution practitioner and mediator. Um, so I work with primarily organizations and community groups um, to manage and resolve and prevent conflicts. Um, we're not great at the prevention part. I don't think anyone really is, but the management part we're getting better at. Um, I do somatic coaching, like one-on-one -on -one coaching for people, like on healing journeys who want to find their creative and spiritually empowered selves. Um, and I write books and consult. I do like a million things, but I see it all as like in the journey of um, like being a storyteller and a healer. Um, and one of my favorite artists to be young, and I know both of you will appreciate this because you're both yeah. artists as well. So to be speaks of the traditional role of the storyteller as a healer and spiritual guide. Um, and I think that is essentially what all three of us are doing. When I think about the work that the two of you are doing around love intersections and your co-op and um, like the cultural reclamation pieces that you're doing, what we do is um, weaving together our stories with community stories to, you know, to to heal, to heal our communities on a collective level. So that's what I do. I suspect it's what you two do on some level as well. It's so, you know, it's so interesting, you know, just thinking about like, I'm just going back to the story of how, you know, we, we were, we came, we, we, we just had just met and we sort of were on the, a similar path. I was also reflecting on the fact that like, you know, you know, I'm thinking about Kai Cheng, your, your last book, how, um, I hope we choose love. And that sort of, that sort of work of, that has also sort of been parallel to what Jen and I were thinking about with love intersections as well. I was wondering though, just going back to the artist piece, how did you go from your, what you studied to being an artist? Oh, good question. Well, <laughs> um, you know, it was, it all happened at the same time. Um, and I think that's why I have like, I think I have a lot of trouble separating my work as an artist from my work as like, um, like a trauma healer or like a community worker um, because they feel really the same for me. Like I, I evolved them at the same time and they influenced each other. Yeah. So, but like when I was a kid, um, I uh, had a very like scary childhood in some ways, like many queer people. And I would always kind of invent stories in my mind. I was like always making up fantasies. I was one of those kids who read a lot. And um, eventually I started putting those stories on paper. Well, I actually started typing them because I grew up in the 90s and thousands, so I was word processing them. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I thought I was going to be a writer of fantasy fiction because I read that stuff when I was a kid. I still read, it's my first love as a genre. So I actually thought I was going to be someone kind of like, um, you know, an Asian Neil Gaiman or like the Asian N.K. Jemisin is like the more social justice kind of reference, right? Um, yeah. And instead I ended up like, you know, I thought I was going to be a fantasy author, but instead I ended up mostly writing, you know, social justice related essays um, and nonfiction. Although I do write fiction too. And um, I thought I was going to be like a straight up clinical psychotherapist and I have done that, but I evolved out of it to do this more sort of like fuzzy, spiritual collective healing work. Um, so those two things grew together and I couldn't imagine, like I tried, I've tried to be like, okay, now I'm gonna drop my community work career and just focus on writing, or I'm just gonna drop my writing and you know performance and focus on healing work. Um, but I can't let go, they're both parts of me. I think because, you know, again, like of that thing to be young is talking about like, 
before colonization, those roles were one. The role of storyteller and healer and spiritual guide were one. And reclaiming that oneness is the only way I feel like I can live. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me sort of like even the things that we've been trying to, I'm just thinking about other parts of my life and even some of the work that we're doing at Value Corp. We were thinking, we, one of the things that we sort of discovered was when we were trying to do, th and you know, Value Corp work, works non-hierarchically. And one of the things that, um, one of the roles, which traditionally would be a project manager, but we, it's more of a project coordinator in thinking of that sort of role <clears throat> and thinking of what is traditionally like um, HR or dealing mm -hmm. with, um, relationships really that those things actually are I think the same thing and so this sort of like how, the, how do we cross over those value pieces that we're we're um, trying to work on yeah that, that's so interesting because like HR is such a corporate thing but here yeah. you are like morphing it into something more humanized that's really related to um, like you want your co-op to um, operate based on the ideals of, of the work that you create outside the co-op too. And I just think, yeah, there's such deep resonance in that. Can you tell? I'm like really big fan. <laughs> really big fan. I, I have been, I'm the big fan because I have been speechless this entire time. I'm kind of just like staring at you um, <laughs> through the computer screen. I guess my question is like through all of this, I have, um, you know, I think the Panini has really revealed a lot um, to everybody. And for me, especially, um, I'm having a particularly hard time where I have existing relationships that I can call upon and um, rely upon. And I do my best to deepen or rather maintain them and sustain them in a way that, you know, makes sense. Um, but I'm having a, a very difficult time cultivating relationships right now because I'm just unable to be in a physical kind of proximity space, which is to say like there is a there is a gap of intimacy that I, I am just not experiencing with people. Um, and so I'm trying to replicate all of the things that and all of the tools that I've learned in the past in 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 relationship work where I am just coming up a hurdle, uh, um, I'm just experiencing a lot of hurdles after hurdles after hurdles. Um, and I just don't really know where to go. And yet I keep finding myself in positions of being the like conflict mediator and having to straddle between various groups of people and complexities and intersections. And it's, it's a trip this year has been. Well, and it's all of a sudden like conversations that, oh my gosh, like, a, a year and a half ago that would be like, no, this needs to happen face to face because yeah. essential that it's face to face. Yeah. That, yeah. Really, or it has to take shape differently now, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have answers to that. Yeah. Sorry, Kai, go ahead. No, 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 I'm just actually, I agree. I don't know if we have answers and I feel both of you so much like, the panini, I love that. I should have steal that if that's the case. I, I didn't make it up. I stole that. <laughs> uh, the panini uh, makes it so much more fun when we call it that. Um, it has really robbed us of a certain kind of relationality. And I think we can see that in like how incredibly well capitalism and its attendant functions, you know, shopping, consuming, the nonprofit industrial complex, those things have actually functioned really well on Zoom, um, for more or less, right? Like there's certain aspects that didn't work out, but as we know, the billionaires have gotten richer and like, you know, <laughs> the gap has increased and I'm busier than ever. I don't know about y'all, but like I yeah. used to have meetings constantly. Um, and, um, but, you know, so that's working out at least as well as it was before the pandemic, maybe better for some like in terms of business. Uh, but, you know, hanging out on Zoom doesn't feel the same. No. Um, when it's, it's not better, it's much worse to, for me anyway. And yeah. I think so is da dating is much worse. And the social aspect of, of working together, not like working capitalism only, but also like working as collective, working as in, you know, do uh, you know meshing our lives to um, to create together? Like, um, 
that that has really lost an element. And so, David, when you're talking about this, like those things that were essential and need to happen face to face, well, now we can't do them face to face. So we're we're trying to do them online. And I mean, it it sort of works because we make it work. But there's a lot of things that don't work too. And I don't know what to say about that except I feel some real grief around that. Like you know, I think we can be innovative and resilient and. We've discovered so many things about accessibility and online yeah. work that we, you know, probably should have figured out a long time ago. Um, but also, you know, we are just a little bit more, or a lot more in some cases, automated, mechanized, yeah. optimized, and a corporate way. Yeah, and I don't, I don't pretend to have answers around that. Yeah. Can I pivot? I want to. I want to ask. Um, when Jen and I were checking in earlier, we discovered we all the three of us are obsessed with Napa cabbage. <laughs> you know that's why we chose um, that for our merch, right? For our tote bag. So when I saw that tote. I was like, oh my god. I mean, we love Napa, so we made it into merchandise. To buy. Oh my god, I was so mad. I was in the grocery store the other day, like two days ago, and I was like looking for my Napa cabbage and they didn't have any. And I was so upset. Like I was like, I was like, I'm gonna cry in this grocery store. <laughs> and why do you why do you like Napa cabbage so much? Did you ask me or Kai? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love Napa because it's super versatile. Listen, um, you can turn it into kimchi. You can make a Napa cabbage slaw. You can um, you can put it most importantly in hot pot where it's it soaks up so much flavor because it has such a neutral base or as a flavor profile. Um, and I learned this from my mom. Um, always pick the the color of the Napa to always pick like the slightly yellowish tone. Um, so not the green varieties because the green varieties are, um, they're just, they're younger. So they're not as sweet. Um, if so, if you let it, it's kind of like how bell peppers age or like the red is the sweetest, right? So it's a similar kind of um, beer. I learned that from you. I learned that from you. <laughs> oh yes, well I learned I that from that my mom. Day. It's now, so I will be using that information. <laughs> why, 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 why do you love Napa so much? Um, because of the texture. <laughs> 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 like purely because um, I especially love Napa when it is like in soups um, because or stews sometimes because it gets like translucent and like the stock has the like the layer that's like the skin but then it's got the like little watery like slippery layer under and then the leaves are just so like tender yeah. it's a beautiful vegetable like yeah. come it's, on it's beautiful so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> why do you what like that David? how do you like I, it the texture too, you know, and I've always been like, I when as I've as I've grown like throughout my life, I I went from like, no, I like the green part best. I know I like the white part best. Um, and then oh no, I like a mix of it all. I just I just love the whole the whole thing. <laughs> I so love cool. it all. I love it. I love it. I love it. Like I love the leaves separated. I love the stock separated. I love it mixed. Oh my God, I could talk about Napa, Napa all day long. Let's write a poem about it. <laughs> can, we, can we work on um, some kind of collaborative art piece? Oh my writing? God, David, can we do it? It's our love letter, to, love letter to Napa. Yes, oh my God, okay. So I'm imagining that I'm like standing by a pool and David, you push me in, but the pool is filled with Napa cabbage floating in the water. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, I've been having the most lucid dreams. I really hope it happened tonight. I want to be pushed into a room of Napa cabbage. <laughs> so listen, Kai, you will love this. Um, I keep a dream journal exclusively filled with David's dreams. Um, he started, <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's a Google Doc um, where we just continuously add to this dream journal, David's dream journal, as I call it. And um, he started telling me these, wild dreams that he was hap that that he was having and this started um maybe like middle of last year maybe fall maybe fall of last year 
And we know that studies are now coming out around like how the pandemic has affected our dream spaces and our dreamscapes. And so I was like, I got to capture all these wild dreams. So I've been keeping this journal and um, I don't know why I'm telling this, but uh, <laughs> one day we will turn some of these dreams. Cause these, these are like very, there's sometimes there's cats, pregnant cats come pregnant. out. Um, time well, travel, dimensions, yeah. Really? So we want to turn it into some kind of film or sci-fi documentary, I don't know. If, you, if David, if you consent, I would like to see this build up of your dreams. Um, Absolutely. It sounds amazing. Yes, please psychoanalyze me, I would love it. <laughs> oh, yes, I mean, you're not supposed to psychoanalyze your cousins, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that reminds me actually of one of my favorite authors and also like a, a, a dear friend, um, you know, Larissa Lai? Yes, we love Larissa. Big no. fan. She's, she's a prophet, of course, a you know, Chinese, queer, Ch queer Chinese Canadian prophet. And so she wrote a book called The Tiger Flu that like, you know, predicted this pandemic in many ways. But she also wrote a book called Saltfish Girl. And in Saltfish Girl, I don't know if y'all remember this, but um, there is a dreaming disease that um, that impacts like the racialized people who are um, sort of like the main subject of the book. And their dreams disease makes their dreams vivid and time travel-y. And like, I'm just saying something magical and powerful is happening. And David, you are the protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> He's the main character, let's face it. Yes. Exactly. And, you know, Jenny and I can have important roles in this. This is a thing. We're going to make something. Yeah, I much prefer to be in like a supportive role and background, um, <laughs> and 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 facilitate, and make sure your your arena that you're playing within is is good and colorful. Um, speaking of. Mm. I, I do want to pivot a little bit because I, I have so many questions, but the one main thing is I wanted to ask perhaps the three of us, um, you know, how we deal with visibility, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. fame and recognition. Cause I think that all three of us individually and also collectively have experience with that um, uh, to, to quite a, an extent. Um, and yeah, I'm just wondering how that impacts what we do, where we do, and how we do. Mm. Well, I think because I actually remember you, Kai, um, before I think David even introduced or me to you. I think he was even before he even shared, you know, that you two had this, mm -hmm. you know, adult reunion of sorts. And I was like, I know that name because you know those articles that used to write would go viral instantly. You know, um, in those days, it was like 2012, 13 days, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I recognized your name, and so your your name still to this day have that kind of proliferation and that effect um, on the internet in our circles. Mm -hmm. um, and Dave and I both have had articles of ours go viral or the work is recognized in this very public way. Oh, yeah. And yes, and so, um, yeah, I'm very curious how us three deal with that and navigate all that. David, yeah. you want to jump in? Sure, well, I, I've just been thinking about like, you know, um, and when Jen and I started Love Intersections, I mean, it was really, it started off as a blog like remember those things, blogs. <laughs> I miss blogs so much. <laughs> yeah, but it was really like you know we didn't hear our stories in this particular situation, and we 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 wrote some pieces together, and then it sort of grew into well, we we want to share our story, so we're going to make films together, and then it grew and grew into you know um, bloomed into what we're doing now, which is making art. Um, but something that I've sort of um, been navigating or encountering is like when you're making something and, you know, and also, you know, love intersections is love intersections. Right. So and seven years, it's actually, I think, exactly around this time, our seven year anniversary. <laughs> but, but, you know, like, you know, seven years later, it becomes this the 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 the, the, the idea of love intersections becomes attached to also who who I am now, too. 
And so like, you know, Jen and I were joking, like um, I think not last year, but two years ago, um, we were invited to, we had a booth at Pride in Chinatown, Paul Wong, um, curates this um, uh, event that was at the Sun Yet Sun when we could have big events. Um, and we did these like little um, uh, plays like, plays on uh, Chinese aphrodisiacs. They were basically gag gifts. So we had like ginseng pop. I still want them. I need them. <laughs> I, I, I'll, okay, I'll get them. <laughs> I have a set for you. Yeah. And, we did, we, and we had one that was like white tears lube and like, horny goat weed, you know? And Jen and I were joking, but there's a seriousness attached to it too. We were like, this doesn't really fall under the Love Intersections brand, you know? What happens when we want to sort of do work outside of what I think, you know, or what I think people perceive of a certain type of work that we do in, in Love Intersections, right? If I may be completely honest and frank about it, that was such an exciting moment because, mm. you know, I think that as artists, First of all, like queer artists, the very kind of like ethos of, of being queer and being artists um, is about breaking free from those expectations and stereotypes. And I, I've never wanted to be confined within a box. And, you know, I think what something that David and I constantly talk about is like as soon as we've kind of figured out what our work is, we've already like moved on from there. We're already wanting to do something else. Um, and so it, it's a matter of like, who's catching up to us or who wants to come along with us, you know, on this ride and just kind of trust us and trust that we're, wherever we're gonna take them is exciting or artful or beautiful. And we were very scared and yet I was like, I don't care. I just wanna do this like gag gift merch line um, of like gins and poppers. It's so not on brand, but like who cares? Um, and of course it's scary within the context of social justice where there is always that underlying cautiousness that I, I have to contend with. Yeah, well, I have to tell you it's been amazing watching like the work um, of love intersections grow and evolve at the same time as your fame grew has grown and evolved, right? Um, and I think you know a culmination of that. I mean, it's obviously still ongoing, but like the the moment where I was like, whoa, like wow, I'm just like so like in some way like I was just like really completely blown away by the work you did around that exhibition in Chinatown um and um like I, I'm sad I like didn't get to see <laughs> like <laughs> the Chinese aphrodisiacs <laughs> come out in their in initial incarnation because that work is so there's such dimensionality to that work right like and I think as social justice has evolved those of us who have been in it for a certain amount of time like in the contemporary, obviously social justice has been around for many, many years, but you know, in this current wave of it, we're starting to play and get playful and be yeah. like, yeah, like there's depth to this art, there's complexity to it. And I don't mind saying that, this is probably gonna get me a little canceled, but like that cautiousness you're talking about, Jen, and also David, like this never trying, like trying to never get anything wrong because we'll, we'll be punished, or, and also because we don't want to offend anyone in a genuine way. Like that can prevent our art from reaching the complexity that, you know, is in our fullest hearts, which then means we lose out on some really complex art. Does complex art make mistakes and get messy and hurt feelings? Well, yes. But, you know, I'm a little bit old school in that I think we need that. And so I just love, I, I don't know, I love the work that y'all are doing. And I mean, the fame piece of it is like, like, I never wanted to be famous, you know? And I didn't actually set out to become famous. Um, I set out to be an artist. I set out to have an audience, but that's different from being a celebrity. Um, and I think it's so important in the social media era that we distinguish that, um, that having an audience is about, you know, creating a relationship. Um, being a celebrity is um, actually pretty dehumanizing. Um, and I don't mean like, oh, poor me or whatever, like, or poor celebrities. We're not, we're also, let's just be like, we're micro celebrities. We're not like actual ones. But it's, it was interesting to me that like that Framing Britney documentary came out recently. I know David, you have thoughts about this, but um, like, like we're starting to realize just how dehumanizing the consumerist aspect of fame can be. Um, 
And I, you know, have no qualms about saying that I think the students can see by contemporary queer culture and, um, you know, by people who are like, like fans. Like I was just you know, I was just on someone's podcast um, recently and a lot of people are kind of finding me. Oh, we're losing you, Kai. Your audio's um, dipping in and out, I think. Is that? Is this better now? Keep, yeah, keep talking. Um, oh, this is like Zoom, this is like online. <laughs> it's it's all, it will always have, yeah. You know, I was, I've been found this week by a few people who hadn't found me before. And a couple of them have been like really like liking every single social media post back to like mid-year, sending me really intense messages about uh, themselves. And you know, I appreciate that they like my work. But they, it just doesn't occur to people, I think, sometimes that like we are all fragile human beings. And I've been, I, I have trauma. So when I see someone suddenly take a deep interest in me like that, um, I get scared, actually. And I don't know about the two of you, but I'm curious to know, like the two of you, do you have that? Like I, I, I my nervous system, like sends me a jolt of pain, actually. Like, like I, like fear when people get really, really, yeah. really interested in me because I know that. Um, how quickly that interest can turn into something like, oh, actually, you've disappointed me. So now I'm going to call you out or now Always. I'm going to, yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 Don't, you know, don't meet your heroes kind of thing. Um, absolutely. It, de it does depend, though. I would say um, I still have, there's one demographic that uh, I don't have that fear with, which is the youth that um, are now adults. Because I did so many um, presentations to you know uh, youth in schools across the province, um, now I get every once in a while an adult who will remember me um, from doing a presentation to their high school, and sometimes it's in a you know um, lovely on the side of the street setting. Other times it's like inside a dungeon at a nightclub, in which case it is inappropriate but also not so um where they're thanking me for making an impact on them as queer kids and um that context is usually um quite moving and um usually is just like wow that's 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 really incredible to experience um but in yes in other contexts where i don't know the person and they know me um there are i go through kind of the waves of I want to be totally honest and open and, and transparent with you, but I am also living in so much fear and anxiety because I don't want to let you down and that I'm a human being. Um, so, so those are the thoughts that run through my head. And and so my in my immediate trauma response is avoidance, and so I will just run away <laughs> from the first. I'll be like, thank you, and then I'll like run away like immediately. I'll find something to do, or I'll find somewhere to hide. <laughs> I support your hiding. <laughs> See, for me, you know. As a Leo, if you can't tell, I'm a Leo. <laughs> table. <laughs> You're my stuffed animals, like. But you, you have like this gorgeous thing. You're a total Leo. <laughs> you know, I can be a little obtuse sometimes. You know, look at the jewelry. You know, and I, as much as I'm joking about it, there's there's so many moments where I'm just like, I went a couple of years ago, went through this process of like, oh my god, I really need to like. Am I going to be interrogated by what I'm putting out of myself, for example, on social media? And then will I get canceled? <laughs> it's this constant fear of like, you know, how much, how much am I putting out, and how much am I, how are people going to to uh, react or interrogate me? Um, yeah, and it's it's still something that I really grapple with. Um, my dear, one of my best friends, Namande, um, I, went, I went, to, went to grad school with her. She and she's also a Leo, and we share a lot of um, Leo um, Leo love, if you will. <laughs> and she she really, um, we sat down and talked about this, and she was just like, "But David, just live your life, you know, live your life, um, and be okay with the way that you're sharing your life too, because mm. you're, you're you're not doing something bad, <laughs> just." Buying purple tulips and wearing too much jewelry. <laughs> and everybody loves it. You need to know this. Everybody loves your tulips and jewelry. <laughs> I, think, I, I 
think I, I, I think about that in terms of like access, like how much do I want people to access me and how much am I able to give myself to you because because of the work that I think that we're all engaging in. And because I genuinely want to connect with somebody, um, I think that my my boundaries has shifted in the past 10 years. I think that I was so open in my, in my mid, in my 20s until near the end of my 20s. I was so, so accessible and so open. Um, and it burned me out super quickly um, over time. And then I closed myself up so, so closed that I had like all the walls around me in order to protect myself from burning out again. Um, and so I'm only just now learning how to like slowly release like parts of me that people can access and and still feel, feel a sense of connection to me. Um, but I, I don't know how to release in a way that isn't going to be a offensive to people or insulting, you know, I still don't know the answer to that. Um, and I don't know how much is too much and how much is too little either. So it's always like a guessing game with a person <laughs> or oh, that's, a community. That's super resonant. What both of you have just shared is really resonant with me, like, especially the piece about like burnout. So I'm, I'm going to turn 30 in, in, oh God, in two weeks. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and, you know, one of the big issues, something I really get quite fired up about um, in social justice culture is, um, I, you know, because it, the, the activism that we have developed is a culture of celebrity. Like even our most favorite people, like, you know, Adrian Marie Brown, um, yeah. like uh, cannot help but live inside a culture of celebrity, right? Uh, like it's not her doing, it's, it was created, it's co-created by all of us. and. Um, it's really informed by this very, I think that Gen Z is solving this problem for themselves, but we are kind of trapped in this like idea that we have to disclose, like that our personal narrative and our activism is always, always, always like enmeshed to the point where we can't tell the difference. And those viral essays that, you know, we were all writing in 2012, you know, there's been, you know, quite a bit of, uh, like already scholarship on this, that was sort of the era of the personal essay. Yeah. Like this, where we were all doing autobiography, the rise possible, like people were writing about their experiences, um, having sex for the first time as, you know, mm -hmm. queer people with certain types of bodies. Like it was it was really, really a lot of disclosure. And, and there's still this idea, I think, that's really hard to escape, that our traumas don't matter, our marginality isn't real, if we don't disclose our suffering. You know, in a very personal way. And because of that, you know, I I disclosed a lot. Like I thought it was a good thing. Like, people always told me my activism was telling my personal story. And I've got a lot of complexes now about like how my worth is tied to the amount of disclosure and the amount of access to me that I give yeah. the public. Um, but as you like, you know, like I think in some ways that you have named Jen, like people don't know boundaries, like they're not gonna give me boundaries by themselves. So um, you know, I've been stalked many times. I'm currently being stalked by a few people. You know, I've received scary gifts and like people have sent messages, you know, that are really, you know, inappropriate and stuff. And so, you know, and I think because of the type of work I do too, is very spiritual in nature. Like people sort of look at me as a guru sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And I see this in like a lot of young queer folks that I've worked with. Um, where they too have this idea that disclosure and claiming a survivor narrative where you have to have all the details of like what you've survived is the only way that they'll get help. And actually all the structures that are like, write about your personal pain for a scholarship, you know, qualify for a sliding scale by talking about your identities. Um, you get to participate in this conversation if you disclose that you're a survivor of something or other. This disclose, disclose, disclose. I see a lot of young people and also some older people now too, um, creating online personas where they're yes. trying to get access and love by um, by by bearing parts of their souls that are actually may be too precious to trust. Yeah. And so I don't know. I just really want that to change. Like we, our pain matters even if we never tell someone about it. Yeah. This yes. is the perfect question to ask. Then, so, um, Morgan had asked. 
do any of you have hopes for the future of social media slash online spaces to lessen this consumerist nature of parasocial relationships? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm not, I am so done with social media. I want Facebook to go away, Instagram. I, and we're done with the aesthetics, the curation of the aesthetic timeline. It is over. I, I'm not, in, I don't, Gen Z, I think like you're right, Kai. I'm, so I, I spend a lot of time on TikTok. And so Gen Z and Alpha Generation are just blowing my mind. Um, obviously, there are still challenges and problems that you speak of in terms of the, the disclosing. Um, what I see, how I see Gen Z disclosing, what I see Gen Z disclosing now is around mental health, is the like the depression, the mental health, the mental illness, the ADHD, like all of that is being disclosed very readily. And that I have, I have challenges around. Um, cause it's, it's reminding me, it's triggering me of all of the shit that we disclosed as well. Mm. Yeah. We disclosed a lot of stuff around, yeah, trauma, like violent, yes. sexual trauma, these things, yeah. abuse. Yeah. 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 Well, I think about like, what could social media be? I'm just trying to put myself back in 2007 when I joined Facebook <laughs> and it was, I mean, at the heart of it was about connection, right? And then as it evolved, you know, 14 years later, I mean, the, the, the Facebook controls the algorithm so hard that, you know, you literally, I think it's one, if you have a page, it's like less than 1% of your posts are organic reach, you get organic reach. So it's all literally you pay Mark or what Zuckerberg to, um, to, for, for you, for people to see your content. Right. Mm -hmm. so it's a totally different, it's a different world. I mean, I think that, we, if we can reimagine, and there's you know many different technologies out there now that are trying to do that, but reimagine social media back to that um, that pl a platform of connection. And I just don't know, quite frankly, if we ever will go back to that because the yeah. world is now where you know I, I'm I'm carving this timeline. So BC is the before COVID, and then AC <laughs> is the after COVID. So like who we were. BC is is it's gone it's done like I don't think we can like I don't think the old Jen is gonna be back I don't think the old David is gonna be back certainly not the old Kai like I I think that we're like I think on a molecular level we're changed beings I just don't know how we'll ever go back to that we gotta you have a lot of faith in like like I agree and I think in the those transformations. Like I have a lot of faith in like the resilient spirit of human resistance. Like, mm -hmm. like, and, and TikTok and Gen Z are such a great example. Like, um, like the generations younger than ours really have very quickly caught on to the fact that fleeting social media is better in many ways than like the permanent social media, and have embraced mm -hmm. that with like a real intensity. Um, uh, you know, like um. Also that like, I, when I used to work with youth as a counselor, I would see them doing like a lot of different strategies to like maintain certain forms of anonymity or privacy. Um, the discussion, I was having a really great discussion with a friend of mine too about like what, you know, I perceive to be a bit of a resurgence of um, like sexual discomfort or like sexual conservatism among like, younger folks. And my friend pointed out to me, well, actually that's because this generation has grown up with really hyper visibility, really intense exposure. And so like the, you know, the response is in some ways about protection. Um, right. And I was like, right, right. Like we're grappling with all this. We're right. gonna come up with ways to try and restore some privacy and anonymity and, you know, the powers that be are gonna try and crush that. It's gonna be a little, like yeah. a cycle. Um, Kai, I wanna know what you're up to next with your art. So you, the book, um, I hope we choose love. Um, are you doing, are, do you have anything coming up or what, are any projects that you're working on? <laughs> I'm laughing because I owe my agent, uh, I'm gonna owe my agent like a book soon. Okay. And I'm like, oh, will it be done on time? If you're watching this, Marilyn and Leonica, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying really hard. <laughs> my agents are very supportive and they will understand, but uh, I just feel bad. I don't deliver on deadlines, but anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm working on two books. One is 
I mean, so I stopped writing for a long time during the pandemic. Uh, it just didn't seem like what I wanted to be doing. I was doing a lot of other things. And, um, I was also sort of like, I didn't know how to be a writer in the pandemic. I was like, how do I make writing that is relevant to the current situation? It took some time. Um, but I'm working on this book about madness in women, women's madness, called Fantastic Tales of Fabulous Women Who Wanted Too Much. And it's this sort of mixed media thing where um, like it's creative nonfiction essays that are sort of like they're, they start out autobiographical um, about different themes around mental health and illness and desire and violence. And then interspersed with those essays are original fairy tales. Like they're not real fairy tales, they're ones that I've made up, each about a different kind of woman. Um, and as the narrative continues, like the voices start between the autobiography and the fiction start to blur together. Um, and this is, you know, my attempt to sort of explore and explicate the experience of, of, of going mad. Um, like that we start to lose the line between the metaphorical and symbolic and the real, um, which is sort of always how I've experienced life but you know, more and more so. And I think the pandemic's a really great example of that on a mass scale. We're just talking about Larissa Lai, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, we are living in a science fiction. The metaphorical has really become the real. Um, and I look at that with horror and this, this book is really inflected with horror because, and I didn't get horror, you know, like I, I've been always that kid who was like too scared to watch a scary movie. And then even as an adult, I was like, well, I mean, I'll go if you make me and then like kind of cover my eyes, <laughs> uh, but like, I read David Demchuk's The Bone Mother, which is the first horror um, novel to be listed for the Giller Prize. Um, and The Bone Mother is about all these um, uh, sort of mythical creatures um, from Eastern European folklore, but uh, who are sort of living in um, like, uh, the time of the famine in, uh, in Eastern Europe, and particularly the Ukraine. Um, and uh, of course, so, so, and then sort of juxtaposes that with the modern day as well. And through reading these stories, I, I, I really owe David this like big thank you because I got horror for the first time. I was like, oh, horror is about grief. Horror is about grief. Like that feeling of like watching something and not being able to change it. And it's unbearable because of the violence and the cruelty um, of it. And that's really, I mean, that feeling of horror is like what's in me, really, to be honest, when I like, am here trapped in my apartment watching through my screen what's happening in the world around me or to queers all around me, especially. I can't change what's happening or what we're doing to each other, but I'm still a part of it. So that's what I'm working on right now. Mm. Wow, that's... I, I'm I'm still ruminating on the horror is grief. Why? Yeah. yeah when now, we watch, sorry. Go ahead. If you watch any of like the really famous horror movies from like even the recent years, all of them are in some way about trauma. Yes. yes. Wow. Yeah. So it's almost six thirty. We didn't ask the question though that we started. We didn't. Okay. Well, but we already got enough for cabbage. But let's ask anyways. Yes, what's your favorite hot pot ingredient? Uh, Napa cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question for Kai, which is to ask you if you would ever consider writing, co-writing something with David and what that might look, what might that be? Oh, David, we've talked about this. Um, I want to know. <laughs> well, we had, um, Kai, you shared some writing with me. And um, uh, we were talking about, it's actually linked, actually this is kind of full circle now, going back to our, our relationship with our, our very different relationships with our grandmother um, and also like culture and identity. You know, I know we've been talking about this every week, but it really was like, I remember like our, our mother's family um, is uh, primarily Poisson speaking, which for those who don't know, it's a dialect of, I think it was, like most of the Chinese people that immigrated to North, this side of North America. Actually, I, almost all of all of the world, the first wave of Chinese diaspora to the world, mostly Toysan at first. Yeah, yeah. And so, but it's now almost, I mean, it will likely be extinct within a generation. 
um, because it's, you know, it's just, I mean, the, it's with, with the, you know, with Mandarin being the Chinese Communist Party saying that this is the, the, the main language and sort of not um, supporting or erasing other languages, um, Busan is just not seen as a language that, you know, that, people, yeah. and so it's sort of like been a, um, so even just the the theme of language, um, Kai, we've talked about, um, because I think we, you and I both have had journeys of either, I've never tried to learn Toisan, but even me trying to learn Cantonese, like I feel like a, a, a failed or an imposter Chinese person because I can't speak, can't speak Cantonese fluently, right? Um, and so it'd be, I don't know, I, I, we, we've shared similar stories um, like that um, before. It'd be interesting to do something together. <laughs> I would love that. I'd love that. We can incorporate the swimming pool and the Napa cabbage and the, yeah, you know, I don't know, like you and I are so much two halves of the same story. Like whenever I hear you talk about our family, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> that's my story from the other. <laughs> yeah, there's some, there would be something really powerful, I think, about making something together. Yeah. So we'll have to talk more about it. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was an amazing conversation. <laughs> and we should, we should probably let you go eat because it's late in Toronto. <laughs> it's true, it is late, but I mean, I don't even notice because I'm so happy to see you both. And also, I'm just like so jealous of the food you have in front of you. <laughs> Okay, I have to confess. I don't know if I've confessed this on Hot Pot Talks yet. This is this is actually like a prop, so I do, but I refreeze it every week. And like, I can't eat like fish balls that have been sitting out week after week after week. So these these are actually I refreeze it. I use it every week. But this this does change every week. <laughs> Today I'm doing a little bit more of a conceptual bowl. <laughs> oh my god, David, can we even trust you anymore? Like, is anything real? <laughs> <laughs> shall we, Jen, shall we announce next week's... Um, yes, let's announce next week's guest. Thank you so much, Kai. That was such a pleasure. Um, who uh, do we have next week? Is it... Is I have collective. Yes, it is Aya Collective from Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, so we're really excited to talk to the Aya Collective. They're an, um, a group of activists and artists in Edmonton that are doing work, um, like a lot of other um, can, uh, a lot of other organizations across Canada, even actually I think around the world, that are doing work around um, culture and identity in 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 Chinatowns. Um, this, of course, in for them, it's in, in Edmonton's Chinatown. So, yeah, join us next week for Hot Hot Talks. Oh, sorry, Thanks. Edmonton, not Toronto. I said Toronto, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes, right. Edmonton, yes, Edmonton. <laughs> I have yes, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> We're getting our cities mixed up. All right, everyone, have a wonderful night, and we'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Bye.